and our passage for the evening is verse 1 through verse 13. The subject is God's rest and man's rest. <coughs> the passage is not an easy passage. Many students of the Bible have pondered it and have wondered precisely what it does mean in some of the features of it, but we will look at it and I'm sure the general thought of it will come home to us. Let me begin and read verse 1 through verse 13 and then I would like to go back and read Psalm 95 because it really is important that we have that in our minds as we read chapter 4 since the author quotes from it a couple of times again. Quoted from it in chapter 3 also. Therefore since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. And let me uh, stop for just a moment and uh, point out this simple fact which you probably understand that when he says the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, referring to the Old Testament uh, individuals, he does not mean the gospel in the sense of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as we now know the gospel the way that the Apostle Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He means the good news of the divine rest which was promised in the Old Testament and also is still promised to them. It's helpful if we remember that the term gospel may be used in a technical sense of Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and was raised again and was seen. That's the technical term of the gospel. But it also means simply good news. And so the good news concerning the Abrahamic covenant, that there would be a seed of Abraham through whom the, the whole world would be blessed, all the families of the world, uh, earth be blessed. That's called gospel in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8 also. It is good news. So good news is the characteristic expression to keep in mind, but the details of it vary with the particular context. Now in verse 3, for we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. It's very interesting. You wouldn't think that that was evidence of entering the rest, but the fact that he said of certain people who were disobedient that he swore that they would not enter into his rest is evidence that there was a rest. And that's his point. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day saying in David, today after such a long time as it has been said today, if you will hear his voice do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, <coughs> Some of you who have the authorized version uh, may note that your text reads Jesus. Jesus and Joshua are the same name. Jesus is the Greek name, Joshua the Hebrew name. My text has made the connection, made the, the, the correction, and your text, if it's the authorized version, probably has in the notes Jesus rather than Joshua. I mean, uh, Joshua rather than Jesus because your text would have Jesus. But it's Joshua. He's talking about Joshua. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. 
Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall or fail according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now I'd like for you to turn to Psalm 95. It's not a long psalm, and I'd like to read that psalm also, because that's the message from the Old Testament that our author has on his mind. This is the psalm that is called Winity because its term or its name is derived from the first words. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great king and the great, I'm sorry, is the great God and the great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth, the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. For forty years I was grieved with that generation and said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. God's rest and man's rest. Men long for peace and rest on earth, but two fatal flaws in their longing exist. Utopia is something that they cannot arrive at. The flaws are simply these, they want it now. That is, they want the leopard and the kid that Isaiah speaks about in chapter 11 to lie down together today. They want the lion to eat straw like the ox here and now. They want everything now. And the second thing that is one of the fatal flaws of man's longing for utopia is the fact that he wants it from man, from himself. Now we've just gone through a political campaign and you must have been deaf if you had not heard the political candidates speaking as if they were Massa's. Each one who runs for office speaks of the glorious things that are going to happen if we follow their particular principles. Well, we're living in the, the year of 1993, and there has never been a political leader who has ever been able to carry out his promises as he has promised them. I think of Nebuchadnezzar in his palace walking about and saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Men are unwilling to recognize the fact that we live in a fallen world and to seek for the reasons why this world has fallen and then by God's grace to become conformed to those things that God tell us, tells us will give us deliverance from the misery that exists in human life. In other words, mankind has a deficient historical perspective. He's forgotten the past. He's failed to get help for the future. What he needs to do is to do what the psalmist did in Psalm 73. He needs to go into the sanctuary and take a good look at things from the divine standpoint. 
That psalm was one of my favorite psalms, and I read it again this afternoon. The psalmist is speaking of the problem of the prosperity of the wicked, and he writes things like this, Truly God is good to Israel to such as are pure in heart. Now this is something he wrote when he had finished his meditation. This is the lesson that he learned. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. These individuals were individuals who had self-esteem wrapped all around their necks, as the psalmist puts it. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. That was such an interesting expression. Their tongue walks through the earth. That came to my mind an old song as I was reading this. I stopped and thought about it. Have you ever seen a dream walking? Have you ever seen a tongue walking? Tongue walking through the earth. When Martha came home, I said, I sang for her too. And she said, well, I haven't seen a tongue walking, but I've seen them wagging. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you can tell how old I am when I remember a song in B.E. time, that's before Elvis time, in case you want to know what it is. But listen to what our psalmist goes on to say, therefore his people return here and waters are, are of, a, of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Isn't that characteristic of our day? Does anyone know about God? Behold, these are the ungodly, who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence, the psalmist said. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, that is, the prosperity of the wicked, and the lowliness of Israel, it was too painful for me until, notice that, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely, Lord, you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. Thus go the desire for riches and fame and prosperity and all of the other things that we chase after on this earth. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all of those who desert, desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. And that brings us back to verse 1. Truly, God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. That really is the problem that most of us have. We tend to look at things horizontally instead of vertically. In other words, man has this distinctive 
this deficient historical perspective. He's forgotten his past. He's failed to get help for the future. He needs to go into the sanctuary for light. The author of the epistle of the Hebrews has the clue to history. Jesus Christ has come and he will come. In the meantime, we rest patiently for God's rest to come. Now, if you were here last Wednesday night, we talked about the illustrations of unbelief which were found in chapter 11. What our author does is to compare Moses and Christ, and he's showing, of course, that Christ is greater than Moses. And then he has taken up Psalm 95 as his text in order to warn those who are reading his letter and any others who might read it later on of the danger of failing to really appropriate the truth of God. He reminds them of the things that happened to the children of Israel at Rephidim when they doubted the presence of God among them. What did they do? The Lord had led them out of Egypt in a marvelous deliverance and brought them through the Red Sea. They're hardly on the other side of the Red Sea before they say, we don't have any water. No water. Now, we live in 1993. All of us can go over to the faucet and turn on our water. So we don't say, Lord, we don't have any water. What we say is something that's a little bit different. It's more suitable for our time. It's more like uh, we don't have financial security. Or we have physical problems. Those are our no waters, whatever it is. And we can all fill in the blank spaces because all of us have them. That's precisely what Israel was experiencing. They were finding that they didn't have what they thought they ought to have, and what were they doing? They were complaining. They did not realize those great promises that God had given them, that he was with them. And the manifestation of that in the miraculous deliverances that he had given to them. And so, no water. And they looked around for scapegoats, and Moses was a good one. And so that's precisely what we do, isn't it? We look for scapegoats. And particularly in churches, you know, we, you can see, see human nature in the church. So if things are not going precisely, it's somebody's fault. And it isn't hard for us to find someone that we can be critical of. Those are our no waters as a body of people. I'm not speaking of believers, chapel. I've been in enough churches to know this is universal. It's universal because it's within universal human nature. We look for scapegoats. And so Israel looked for scapegoats. And then they had 40 years in the desert. You would think you would learn in 40 years, wouldn't you? But our author has taken that incident, Rephidim, and then he has taken the second incident 40 years later when the children of Israel, when Moses, as their leader, was told to speak to the rock rather than to strike it. And you'll remember that Moses, instead of speaking to the rock, smote it twice while he said, must we bring water out of the rock. Amazing. He's already taken to himself, arrogated to himself the power of God. It's God who performs miracles, but Moses is saying, must we do this? So, again, the same lesson. Our author calls it an example of unbelief. In chapter 4, verse 11, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. And we talked last Wednesday night about the fact that faith and unbelief are very serious things. These are not trifling things matters. In fact, unbelief is not a trifling sin. It's a deadly sin. 
It's a fatal sin. It means, of course, if we have never believed in Christ, that we have fatally lived apart from the forgiveness of sins. But as Christians, unbelief is the fatal sin. Every day we have an opportunity to believe. But if we do not believe, if we do not rest, to use his word, if we do not rest, that's not a trifling thing. That's a big thing. It's a big thing for all of us. The reason I am able to speak so assuredly about this is because I fail right here so often. But it's important, unbelief. And I'm sure that if you think about the Word of God at all, you know that it's filled with illustrations of this. I think I made reference last Wednesday night, I've forgotten, to the crisis that was in Judah in the time when Ahaz was the king and the king of Syria, Reason, and Pekah, the king of Israel, were attacking Judah. And Ahaz was very much troubled. And the Lord spoke to him through Isaiah the prophet and said to him, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken, so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. Now, notice these words. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. And the Lord called upon Ahaz to ask for a sign. Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or the height above. And Ahaz said, I don't want to ask from the Lord a sign. I wouldn't test him. God's invited him to do it. So he said, no, I wouldn't want to do that. But this statement surely, as verse 9, the last part of verse 9, if you will not believe, surely you shall not be established, is so beautiful in the Hebrew text because it's just the kind of thing that someone would remember. Im lo tha'aminu ki lo tha'aminu. Im lo tha'aminu ki lo tha'aminu. A play on words. So they would remember. So, as he says, if you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Now, the author is going to admonish the Hebrew readers against failure. And I think I need to say just a word about the kinds of rest that are found in the Bible. There are really three kinds of rest. Now think we say this and we can go through the passage rather quickly. There is first of all the rest of salvation. Now we all know how before we found the Lord as our Savior, if we thought at all about spiritual things, unless the Holy Spirit awakened us suddenly, we thought about the ways by which we may gain approval with the Lord God by the God by the works that we do. The world's full of that. The world believes that we get to heaven by our good works. That's why there's so much in the Bible about good works shall not get you to heaven. The simplest texts, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we think we're going to get to heaven by our good works. Good works covers lots of things with a lot of people. I grew up in the kind of society in which it was a good work to be living in the part of town in which I was living, to have the kind of family that I had, to be invited to become a member of the St. Cecilia Society. That qualified as good works because God never rejected a member of the St. Cecilia Society. Surely. In fact, the apostles themselves had to get special invitations to attend, I'm sure, if it had been in existence in those days. But then, of course, we think of the ways in which 
By religion, we get to good work, get to heaven. I'm a Baptist, or I'm a Presbyterian, or I'm a member of the Christian denomination, or I'm a member of a fundamentalist church, or whatever the case may be. So, finally, the Lord God has to cause us to realize through the Holy Spirit that we are lost and the gospel comes to us and we realize we cannot get to heaven on the basis of what we do. But salvation must come as a gift so that we have no claims on God whatsoever because he's trying to teach us what we are and he's trying to teach us also what he is, a God of loving kindness, mercy, and grace. That's the kind of God we have. And so we learn that we're not saved by our works. And we are told, and that's what we do, we rest in what Jesus Christ has done. Put it this way a little better, we rest in Jesus Christ and what he has done. That's the rest of salvation. No longer trying to work my way to heaven. Constant defeat is that way. That's the first rest. I think it's what our Lord was talking about in passages like Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, when in this very familiar passage, you'll remember it when I read it, I know if you don't know it already. The Lord Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The rest of eternal salvation. So we never for any time after that ever boast about what we have done in order to attain to salvation. But there's also a rest of sanctification which the Lord is trying to teach us. It's what we might call the rest from the activity of the self-life which is still a part of our being. Have you noticed after you've become a Christian, I speak to those of you who are Christians, that you still have a lot of the same kinds of problems? Did you know, did you notice that when you became a Christian, you still were afflicted with such things as greed, jealousy, envy? In fact, all of the seven deadly sins, you probably can find some traces of all of them in your life. And then the Holy Spirit who now indwells you begins the work after you've been saved, begins the work of bringing you to the place where you stop in your Christian self-life of trying to justify your existence before the Lord and win holiness by your activities. And so you start learning the simple principle that life is to be lived by faith in the working of God who dwells within us. And so when those no waters, no food, no bread, that's what Israel had to face, when all of those experiences come, what do you do? You turn it over to the Lord and expect Him to meet your need. There are many ways in which some of you in this audience I know have discovered the truth of that. That God has promised, has sworn that he will take care of all of his saints. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that marvelous to know that he has sworn that he will take care of all of his saints in the experiences of life, whatever they are. Maybe that's what our Lord was saying about finding rest in that same passage. But at any rate, this rest is God's rest. Some have called it the faith rest life. That's pretty good. I think that's certainly true. I was reading in my notes this afternoon something that I had clipped out some time ago about Bishop Westcott, who was a British evangelical Anglican and who has written some marvelous books that I still read in my studies, including a commentary on this great epistle. 
but this particular thing that I cut out, it's not in his commentary. The son of the scholarly and saintly Bishop Westcott said concerning his father, in his later life, my father obviously lived in two worlds at once. While his feet were set in the world, his spirit was in the presence of God. Everything that came to him was met in that presence. Nothing could ever surprise him from that attitude. That's what life and the holiest really means. When the experiences of life come from a sovereign God who controls our circumstances and in the midst of them we turn to the Lord and say, Lord, you have brought this into my life. Now give me the strength to rely upon you in this experience. We call that the present rest of holiness, sanctification. Holiness in the sense not of sanctimoniousness, but holiness in the sense of separation to the Lord God. Now there's a third rest, and that's what our author speaks about. This is the rest that man is to enjoy forever. It's the rest that we anticipate with the coming of the kingdom of God upon the earth. That rest, that Sabbath rest as we shall see the kingdom of God upon the earth when the promises of God have reached their fruition and God rules and reigns over all of this earth. It may be called the millennium for the first thousand years of it form a millennium, but it is a kingdom that extends also into the indefinite future, the eternal future. I was reading this afternoon in a book that I have on the use of the Old Testament and the New Testament and the author was talking about this particular passage and I had not noticed one of these comments and the other one was appropriate and so I'd like to mention them. Hendrikus Burkhoff is a well-known liberal Dutch theologian. Now he has been a bit disturbed over the things that have happened in history since uh, in 1948 Israel came into existence. And Burkhoff is in the Reformed Church of the Netherlands, which basically does not believe in a kingdom of God upon the earth and the fulfillment to the nation Israel of those promises in the Word of God. Most of those men believe those promises are no longer applicable to Israel, ethnic Israel, but will be enjoyed by the church at large. Well, listen to what he said. With the surprising geographical and political fact of the establishment of the State of Israel, this was 1948 as you know, the moment has come to begin to watch for political and geographical elements in God's activities which we have not wanted to do in our Western dualism, docetism, and spiritualism. Here is a theologian, one of the best known of the Netherlands, in fact one of the best known among Protestant theologians of a liberal uh, bent and saying that we may expect political and geographical elements in God's activities lying before us. It's almost as if he were saying I'm going to become a premillennialist. He doesn't say that but that's what it sounds like. And then Willis Beecher lecturing some years ago at Princeton Seminary chided them by saying, but if the Christian interpreter persists in excluding ethnical Israel from his conception of the fulfillment or in regarding Israel's part in the matter as merely preparatory and not eternal, then he comes into conflict with the plain witness of both testaments. The reason he's saying this, of course, is because those promises of the covenant and the blessings of the covenants of the Old Testament are said to be everlasting covenants. That's serious in the Word of God. His interpretation, he continues, is even less consistent with the text than is the exclusive Jewish conception. Rightly interpreted, the biblical statements include in the fulfillment both Israel, the race with whom the covenant is eternal, and also the personal Christ and his mission with the whole spiritual Israel of the redeemed in all ages. So when we talk about the future rest of the kingdom, 
We're talking about those great promises in the Word of God over and over in the Old Testament that say that ethnic Israel has a glorious future lying before them. I know you expect me to say something about where I am in reading the Bible. So I'm finishing up Hosea, and I'm very deflated. I was proud, thinking that I might be leading everybody in this congregation in reading through the Bible. And Estelle is way ahead of me. And I've got to turn to the Lord and ask Him to deliver me from my pride <laughs> and feeling of disappointment that I'm not first. But to get to the point, I've been impressed again reading through these great prophecies, particularly Jeremiah and Ezekiel, what God said through those prophets about the coming kingdom of God that was eternal, those everlasting promises. We cannot read the Bible and forget them. It's very important. Now the author of the epistle of the Hebrews, in my opinion, does not forget them. Now will you follow with me as I'm going to look down through the verses and make comments as we go along, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the good news was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them. He's talking about those individuals in the Old Testament who had the good news of the promises of God given to them and the patriarchs to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, but who did not believe and fell away. For we who have believed do enter into rest, as he has said. Now when he says do, he means in the sense of because we have believed, we are in process of entering into that rest. He uses a present tense here. It's been called a futuristic present. We who have believed do enter that rest. That's our hope. We do enter it. You in this audience who have believed in Christ, you are in process of entering into that rest. If you're a believer, you may not even know it, but you are. You're on the way to the kingdom of God is what he means. So we do enter into the rest as he has said. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Now the reason that sounds uh, contradictory if you think about it for a moment, but all he wants to do is simply to affirm the fact there is a rest. And the fact that he swore in his wrath that certain ones would not enter into his rest is evidence there was such a thing as a rest. God would never say, you are not going to enter into my rest if there was no rest at all. So the fact that he warned the Old Testament professing individuals, you're not going to enter into the rest was evidence there is such a thing as a rest. For, he goes on to explain, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested in the seventh day from all his works. Well, what has that got to do with it? Well, you'll remember when God created his world, what a bright and glorious and beautiful and holy world it was. And then he rested from his works. That world, a glorious, bright, holy world created by God. And he rested. And you'll notice on the seventh day in the scriptures, it does not say there was morning and there was evening. It said that about the other six, but not the seventh. Because that day is looked at as continuing forever. Except that there occurred a fall, didn't there? In the third chapter, a fall. That disturbed the rest of God in that sense. So, God rested on the seventh day from his works. Incidentally, the kingdom of God upon the earth is the extension of that rest which God enjoyed when he created all things and the beauty and glory of that creation. Verse 5, And again in that place they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore 
it remains over. That's the meaning of that Greek word, incidentally. It's a term that really means literal, to remain over. That is, the promise is carried on. It's still in the Bible, even though man has sinned. Since, therefore, it remains from past times that some must enter the rest, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying, In David. Now that's in Psalm 95. It doesn't mean David was the author of that psalm. If you looked at Psalm 95, you'll see it doesn't have a name of an author over it. But it's the term, the expression that was used to say in the part of the Bible where the Psalms are is the meaning. We could translate it in the Psalter, as we would say. Saying in the Psalter, today, after such a long time, think of it, hundreds, centuries have passed since the original promises of the kingdom of God, since the creation, since the original promises, and in the Psalms, the psalmist speaks still of a rest. It's still there for the entering. So, saying in David, today, after such a long time, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. In other words, in David's time, in the time of the Psalms, the rest could be entered. For, he said, if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. You probably thought that when Moses brought them up to the land, the promised land, and Joshua led them in, that was the rest. No, no. You read the Old Testament, Joshua did not give them rest. If Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken years later in Psalm 95 that there is a rest. Do you get the point? Joshua and the children of Israel entering the rest of the land did not fulfill the rest of the land as in the Word of God. He would not have spoken of another day. There remains therefore, verse 9, there remains therefore, here in this age, when this man wrote, the New Testament age, there remains a rest for the people of God is still available. The word that he uses is very interesting. You'll recognize it immediately. You don't know any Greek, but you'll know this. It's a sabbatismos. You get it, don't you? What kind of rest? Say it. Sabbath rest. A Sabbath rest. That's very interesting because in the early church they thought of the kingdom of God as illustrated by the Sabbath. Sabbatismos. In fact, in the early church, in some of the apostolic writers, they regarded the history of the world as being a 7,000 year history, like the days of the book of Genesis. And the last day, the seventh day, would be the Sabbath. And that was the day the thousand years that corresponded to the millennial kingdom. You'll find that in some of the earlier writers just after the apostles. The Sabbath. The Sabbath is the kingdom, a Sabbath rest. Our author picks up on that and calls the kingdom that is to come a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Sabbatismas. The original intended rest when God created the heavens and the earth and specified no length for that seventh day, that original intended rest now attained as a result of the redemption that Jesus Christ has come and accomplished. Now we read back in chapter 2, I want to see how well you followed along and you experts and you experts in Hebrews up to chapter 4 at the present time. You have no excuses. I've just been giving you the word and it should have been going in and lodging in your minds. You remember back in chapter 2 and verse 5, he wrote, 
He has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You've made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. So he's talking about the creation. Lyrically, this is Psalm 2. Looking back at Genesis, the psalmist is writing a poem about the creation. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. That was Adam in the Garden of Eden. Now he says, For in that he put all things in subjection under him, he left nothing that was not put under him. But now, now, as he looks around now in this age, now we do not yet see all things put under him. What a discouraging note. What a disappointment. Glorious future. But now, we don't have this situation. Man's not over the creation. Ninth verse. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for everyone. Ah, as we look around, we don't see the kingdom at all. We see the, the world that God created fallen and the evidences of the fall everywhere. Read the newspapers, all of them. Read anything about this world, the evidences of the fall. What do we as Christians do? But we see Jesus. He has overcome. He has died for that sin that this world is so immersed in. And the time is coming when that great redemption shall become a fact of human experience. And those who are the believers shall enter into that rest and enjoy the intended rest that God has set forth in the Word of God. He calls it a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Now, let me go on and finish up here. He says, For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. In other words, the person who has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ has ceased from his works of self-justification, self-sanctification, and ideally, he's walking by faith in God. And what is he looking forward to? The kingdom of God. The glorious kingdom of God. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and the kingdom. Now the 11th verse. Incidentally, uh, I'm not going into detail here about the Jewish teachers and Philo and others who make the point that the Sabbath prefigured the world to come. The day which shall be all Sabbath, they said. I've tried to make that point. It's not need, don't need to go into great detail. We need to finish up. So in verse 11 through verse 13, let us therefore... That is, in the light of the fact there is a rest of God, and also, since it is possible for individuals to profess that they have this rest, and yet fall, as he says, according to the same example of disobedience, let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest. The fact that he says... We who have believed are entering. And then he says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, indicates that this is a rest that lies in the future. This is the kingdom rest that he's talking about. To enter into that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. Fall, fall away by apostasy and lose that rest that they are professing that they have. I say apostasy. We'll talk about that later on. I can defend that, I think, but I'm not going to try to do it now. It would take too long to do it. Some people think of that as simply falling away to unfruitfulness. 
but I think I'll be able to show you that there is a whole lot of evidence that indicates that he means falling away to lostness before the Lord God. But let me go on. For the Word of God is living and powerful. You know, when we talk about the Word of God, we are talking not about the Word of Plato. We're not talking about a political leader. We're not talking about a, uh, a Reagan or a Bush. And we're certainly not talking about a Clinton. That's the only tip that I will give you how I feel about those people, but you know. But I include them all together because they're all politicians and I haven't seen any politician who has the mantle of perfection draped over his shoulders yet. They're all bad. In, in some ways, they're all bad. George Washington, too, I'll throw him in as well. The same example of disobedience. The Word of God, the Word of God is so different. Our politicians tell us, we're not going to tax you. We're going to tax those rich people. Tax those people who've got too much money that have been taking advantage of you all this time. We're not going to tax you. So we're just going to tax gasoline. Now, how many of you in this particular audience do not have an automobile? You'll not be taxed. You think? No, you'll be taxed. Everybody is going to be taxed. But we heard all before the campaign, both sides, some more than others, but both saying the same thing, we're not going to raise your taxes. We're not going to raise your taxes. Now what are they talking about? Every day it's some new tax that's going to be raised. I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong. Maybe all of you folks who are rich should pay all of those taxes. The point I'm making is the word of a politician is not like the word of God. The word of God is living and powerful. His word is effective. When he speaks a word, it's a word that means something. Now, the Hebrews thought of a word that way. They didn't think of a word like you and I think of a word. We think of a word as a sound. To them, a word was a power. It wasn't a sound. It's what it meant that was the important thing. And much more so with God. It's not the sound. It isn't the fact that God speaks with a resounding sound like thunder. His voice is the sound of many waters. Woody Allen once said that no one could cause a rumble in the desert like the Lord God when he spoke. But that isn't the point. It's not the rumble. It's what it really is in itself because when God says something, eternal divine power stands behind it and it shall be done. The Word of God is living, not a dead promise. Living and powerful. That's what the Word of God is. So when we read the Word of God, we're not reading something that's just a sound. But it's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, pier piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit. It's penetrating. Suppose I were to hand you a sword and say, would you go up to Howard Pryor and pierce his spirit? You would say, what's happened to you? But us assuming you would say, that's something Dr. Johnson might say. That's a rather hopeless task, isn't it? I might, the person might say to me, where is his spirit? Is it in his head, his shoulder, his body, his stomach, his legs? What God speaks is that that pierces so penetratingly that it can divide between soul and spirit, something you and I could never do. The Word of God. And then he says, and there is no creature 
hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The promises of the Bible are no dead letter. That's a marvelous figure, naked and open to the eyes. It was used of an individual in the Roman Empire who was taking someone out to be executed. And people who are criminals, you know, even in our society, want to turn their heads down like this because they don't want you to see them or they put something over their face or they turn away. Well, the Romans had an individual who took someone out like that and they would take a sword and they would put it under the person's chin like this so that when he walked out to his punishment, he had to look everybody in the eye in shame. This is the word that was used. It's something put under the neck. So the word of God is open to the eyes. All things are open to the eyes of him with whom we must give account. God's glorious rest in which man may participate by faith is still available, what he is saying. The human longing for peace and rest is future and it's given by God. It's in the coming kingdom of God. Our author later on in the 12th chapter says this, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. So what is the exhortation? Well, there is an imperative necessity for immediate action because today, it's today, if you will hear his voice, that our author speaks about. May God cause us to respond accordingly and remember that there are individuals who fall after the same example of disobedience as the children of Israel. May God bring it to pass that we, I, you, are not among them. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we are so grateful to Thee for these warnings, for we surely need them. And Lord, as we read and ponder the Scriptures, by Thy grace, work mightily in our hearts to deliver us from ourselves, from the sin principle that dwells within us, from our desires that are contrary to the Word of God, that do not glorify our Lord Jesus Christ, and give us great desire to be pleasing to Him, and to please Him, and please Thee, through submission and obedience, for Jesus' sake, amen.